Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, well, today I always I always enjoy today because it's the last Tuesday of the month, which means I get to have Tom Campbell on for an hour. Well, usually. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little more. Um, I always love having Tom on. We always have some amazing shows. So we're coming up to the holidays right now, although it probably won't be out. It might be out before, but uh, we're coming up to Halloween, which is kind of the, I don't know if it's the beginning of the holidays or not, but it seems to be the trigger to the next set. Mind you, here in Canada, we've already had our Thanksgiving. Uh, we had it a few weeks ago. Um, so I thought we'd talk, we usually talk, last year, this time, we talked a tough love episode, which was kind of cool. Um, this year, I wanted to talk about Thanksgiving and fears. It's kind of similar. Our shows are always kind of similar. We like to you know, look at the application of Tom's work so that we can get out of our fears and into a love-based uh, space. Um, it's a challenge, but it's fun if you can look at it that way. <laughs> so let's start this off, Tom. How, how are you? Just fine. Just getting back from an event in California a few days ago, and that worked very well. It's nice and warm there. Wasn't, uh, so chilly and wet as it is here, but that's all right. I like wet. It's been so dry this summer that, that wet feels good, actually. Wow. We've kind of been the opposite here, but we are kind of moving into our fall. We pretty much, pretty much all of our trees have turned. Well, not all of them, but it's getting there. It's always pretty this time of year. Okay, so Thanksgiving kind of brings up a lot of memories. We, it's like we try to create a perfect memory from our past when we were children and completely ignorant and innocent <laughs> of what actually involves Thanksgiving and having the whole family and mm -hmm. the perfect <clears throat> dinner. Um, and I think that's where we kind of get stuck. We, we love the holidays in some sense, but as soon as we get together with family, it becomes very challenging and difficult and of course we strive for something we think is perfect that uh, never seems quite add up to what we have in our thoughts and I know that it's all fear-based because you know that perfection thing is just ego wanting to wanting something wanting us to be well pushing us more than wanting us <laughs> all right so maybe not the tough love episode this year but let's let's challenge let's let's look at it and how we can sort of move through this time okay you know thanksgiving is really about gratitude mm. i mean that's the point right it's thanksgiving and unfortunately we we have a tendency because we tend to be self-centered and fearful which is where the fear comes in to look at what's wrong and to not pay much attention to what's right. Mm. And that is the biggest part of the problem. Because if Thanksgiving is about giving thanks and about gratitude, then we should focus on all the things that are, that are good. You know, all the things that are, um, oh, I don't know, you know, pleasant as they should be, uh, you know, that we'd appreciate. And that includes people that maybe challenge us you know if we're all healthy we're all still alive you know another year um you know everybody still has a job you know these kinds of things well you know the children aren't sick we should be grateful for that you know here we are you know everything's working it's working fine and not focus on the well i don't have everything i want you see that's not the that's not the the point of focus of of gratitude is I not have every I don't have everything I want it's look at what I do have and it's really pretty good particularly when I look around me and see what a lot of other people in the world have I'm actually doing pretty well 
at least I'm not, uh, you know, huddled in a bombed out building someplace or don't know, you know, where the food's going to come from or have a bunch of crying children and nothing to feed them. You know, my life's not in that category at all. You know, if you look at things that way, you can say, well, we're real, we're pretty well off here. Things are, you know, things are uh, not that hard, but we don't do that. We tend to look at what's wrong and we go visit our relatives or they visit us and we immediately focus on what's wrong with them, which basically boils down to why they don't agree with us. <laughs> so if people disagree with you, then they're wrong. You know, it's that sort of thing. People feel that whatever their opinions are and whatever they do, that is what defines correct and right. So if other people disagree or have other opinions, then they're wrong and have a problem. And then we get annoyed with people who don't agree with us because they're not agreeing with, agreeing with us. They're not, they are not uh, validating our point of view. They're challenging our point of view. And since it's all about us, well, then that just makes us aggravated because they should be validating us and our point of view. You mm -hmm. see, and that's where it all, you know, goes wrong is individuals who you know, live at the center of their own universe and it's about them and what they want and the way they want people to be. Now in their own mind, they don't see it that way. Like, oh, it's just, you know, it's my needs and my wants and my things and I'm self-centered. Nobody <laughs> thinks about life that way. Everybody thinks about, well, you know, my, my opinions are very reasonable and my sense of what's right and wrong, you know, is, is the right way to look at things. And if it varies too much from what I think, then it's wrong and it isn't good. And people continually to push their, their not good stuff, you know, in my face, then I get upset and I get angry. But really, it's just an angry that they're being some way other than the way I want them to be. You know, how dare they be some way other than the way I want them to be? You see, so when you look at it that way, it's pretty silly. You can see, yeah, wow, that's pretty self-centered junk that we have going on but that's typically the way it is and why people get upset with other people rather than saying well everybody was healthy enough to to meet here at such a you know grandma's house for thanksgiving and and you know the kids are all healthy and running around and doing whatever and phew, life is good it could be a lot worse let's just be grateful for the things that we have let's have some gratitude gratitude for what's good for us, opportunities we have. And that's hard. <laughs> yeah. That's hard. So it's, more, it's much easier to look around and say what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you pick apart each person and you judge them and you assess them. And your judgment is how much do they agree with you and see the world the way you see it? Well, those are the good people and they understand things, and they have right attitudes. And everybody else is annoying. Everybody else has, a, you know, has, has problems. And of course, everyone's doing that. So the people on the other side of that are looking at you and saying, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> he or she's, one, you know, they're annoying. Just as you look at them and say that, you know, everybody's doing the same thing. They're looking at it through their own perspective. And, when they see other people being different than them, that's a problem. Well, we should have gratitude for those differences. They help us grow. They challenge us. They um, give us more opportunities. We should try to understand other people's opinions that are different than ours, not just discount them, but actually see where are they coming from? Not just where did they go wrong, you know, but where are they, where are they coming from? And then we should just let them be whoever they are and say, well, that's just the way they think. That's okay. We can still tell jokes and laugh and talk about our kids and, you know, have a good time interacting, even though we're different. We can, don't have to talk about those differences or worry about them or set them aside or focus on them. We can focus just on having fun with each other. 
So I think that's the right attitude for Thanksgiving. It's just to be grateful and let all the, the things that are wrong with everybody else and everybody else's children go. Not your problem. Don't worry about it. Don't judge it. Just say, that's the way they are. For whatever reason brings them to that, that's the way they are. Accept it and then let it go. So I think that's the key. But yes, it all boils down to fear. It's fear that makes you frightened because people are different than you. Because they're not validating you by playing your own opinions back to you. That means that maybe you're wrong. They think you're wrong. You see, they disagree with you. You disagree with them. Well, if you're insecure and somebody thinks you're wrong, that just, you know, what strums your fear. You know, that just resonates with your fear. I'm inadequate. I'm insecure and somebody thinks I'm wrong. Oh, no. And then in order to turn it away from yourself and your responsibility, it's how dare they? They're all screwed up. It's not that I'm wrong. It's they're wrong. But the whole reason we get into this who's right, who's wrong judgment is because of our fear that we somehow aren't good enough, that we may be wrong. And anything that points that finger of wrongness at us, at us makes us angry because it triggers that fear. And we find somebody to blame it on because certainly we wouldn't want to blame it on ourselves. And certainly we can't be wrong. Right. We must be right. Being right is very, very important. And if we're right and those other people are different, then they must be wrong. And we focus on this right wrong, you know, to the exclusion of everything else. And then we miss the stuff that we should really be grateful for because we're so, so wrapped up in the, in the uh, problem of rightness and wrongness because we're so self-centered. That's how we see the world. So it's fear is at the very root of that attitude of judging. If you don't have fear, you don't have to judge people. Okay, now you can, you know, you can assess people when you meet them. You know, when you first meet somebody, you try to assess who they are. Are they friendly? You know, are they not friendly? Uh, whatever. But that's not what I'm talking about by judging people. I'm talking about judging them and their, their value, their worth, their rightness or wrongness. Um, you know, whether you uh, agree or disagree with them, judging them in, in that way, rather than just interacting with them however they are. So even if they're grumpy and talk about politics that you don't like, or talk about religion that you don't like, or talk about whatever else it is you don't like, well, then join another, another subject group or change the subject or ask them about, you know, the, how their health is, or just change the subject. Start off on a different tangent and you know, go down that road for a while. It's uh, generally not that hard to do, to get people to focus on something else other than their own judgments, their own trying to convince everybody else to, you know, to think the way they think. So we just set that aside for a while and get to know each other a little bit. What's been going on in your life? You know, how's, how's work? How's the family? You know, did Susie ever get over her cough and so on? How's grandma? And then it becomes fun. You know, family gossip, uh, family stories, uh, family history. Um, sit around, uh, maybe go around the table and um, uh, say something that you're grateful for. Something that you'd give thanks for. You know, that might change the mood a little bit. Just don't focus on what's wrong right. focus on what's right or what's neutral or what could be not not on what's wrong that's what that's your fear that makes you do that focus on what's wrong because you're trying very hard not to be wrong or not to have anybody see you as wrong that's why wrong is so important to you and right is so important to you so we just get rid of that fear and then we can enjoy people, whether we disagree with them or not, whether they're right or wrong or not, doesn't matter. 
we can just interact with them or whoever they are. So if we'd all do that, then these holidays would be really very special and everybody would look forward to them. And I guess in a way we do look forward to them. It's just that when we get there, we have all this judgment waiting for everybody. And we put everybody in their place and who's doing what to who and who's right and who's wrong and who's good and who isn't and who's confused and who isn't. And all of that is very self-referential. So that's that tends to be what ruins holidays. It's people's self-centeredness and their fear. Well, the self-centeredness is just a you know a result of their fear. That's uh, so. I guess that's true of all the holidays. We could say that again at Christmas. You know, we could say that again at Easter. All the time that people get together, and the reason it's families is where this happens, is because that's where all the learning and challenge comes from is in families. It's the people we're closest to, the people we're related to, the people we can't avoid, <laughs> the people that are going to show up anyway, you know, whether they like it or we like it. You know, it's those family members that give us our challenges to grow up. Yeah. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. So, you know, we need these holidays and we need, uh, you know, connections with our families because that's where we can grow. So this Thanksgiving, when you're all sitting around the table and you're, you're judging everyone and, you know, well, I wonder if George is drunk. You know, he, he has this drinking problem. So let me assess George and judge to see how sober he is. And now let me look at, you know, Aunt Susie and judge to see how, you know, petty she is because she's always a petty person. You know, so you come with all these beliefs and, and, judgments rather than just enjoy the people the way they are so that'd be a big challenge in growing up just not to do that not to do that judging because it's all just self-centered fear junk ego junk it's all dysfunctional to judge other people to decide who's right and who's wrong the good guys and the bad guys Good guys agree with me, bad guys don't. Yeah. It's funny how we get so focused on, I guess, just like you said, what we want. It's not, you know, what we can do for everybody. It's, you know, it's just us being so ego driven that we're mm -hmm. always trying to justify that we're right. Sure. Well, by definition, we're right. You know, we just believe that. That's a that's a belief. Because if we don't want to believe we're ever wrong, and if we even find out we're wrong, mostly we try to ignore it or make up, you know, excuse it, make up a, you know, make up an excuse or something. So we're not really wrong. We just just had a misunderstanding, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's very important when you feel insecure and inadequate that you appear to be in your own mind good and complete and you know doing things the right way for the right reasons that's very important to you if you feel insecure and inadequate you want that image of rightness it's very important and if anything gets in and and brushes or or scratches that image of of rightness then you get angry and you get angry because that's what your fear does. When, when your fear gets triggered, you get angry. And what you need to get is say, well, I'm feeling a little upset now. Why is that? What am I really upset about? And of course, what you'll find out is, oh, I'm upset because things aren't the way I want them. People aren't the way that I want them. People don't have the attitudes I want them to have. Well, they don't have the attitudes that I know are the best attitudes. <laughs> um, you know, it's that sort of thing. And that's what's upsetting because everything isn't the way you want it to be, including the people or whatever else. That's what the judging is all about. Yes, it's, it's so obviously just self-centered. You know, it's what you want and what you need. And you need people to say things to you that make you feel good make you feel special, make you feel right, and make you feel just, 
And when you feel those, when they make you feel like that, well, those are good people and you really like them <laughs> because they don't challenge you. They, ver you know, they validate you. So those are the good people. And then the people that challenge you are the people you can learn from. You need to learn to not respond to that with anger or upset or annoyance or condescension or anything else. You need to strive to just interact with them just as human beings. We're all grateful just to be here. All grateful just to be doing so well as we are to sit here with more food than anybody can eat when a lot of people don't have enough. You know, how good is that? You know, look at the very basic things. We got shelter. It's cold and windy and rainy outside. And look, we're sitting in here nice and warm and, and uh, you know, in a, in a nice environment. You know, how good is that? Just enjoy the, the stuff that's really right with the world. Your life, you know, how just the fact that you are and you have an opportunity to grow. You have an opportunity to make better choices. How much better can it get? That's good. And the fact that things aren't the way you want them, well, okay, that'll help me grow. That'll help me learn. I'll be, you know, I'll meet those challenges without the fear. So it's those people that, that annoy us that really are our best teachers. <laughs> if we're willing to take the, take yeah. that, uh, exploratory look at right um, well if we're, if we're willing to get over our fear because right. if we don't get over our fear then that's not going to it's just not going to work and even if we just smile at everybody and never say anything cross and never uh, do any of those things because we're acting nice that won't help us grow up it'll help everybody else have a better time because we won't be the wet blanket but it won't help us grow up any Yeah, it's that self-centeredness, and it's endemic. You know, most of us are self-centered. And ironically, at times when we have holidays like this, where we're inviting people to our home or being invited to somebody's home, I mean, you're thinking that you're trying to do the best for everybody else, but it's really, <laughs> it's really the best for you. Yeah, you're trying to get everybody to think something positive about you. Right. I will make this I will make this meal perfect and everybody will love me. Yes. Everybody will be so appreciative. And then somebody says, Oh, I don't like broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I can't eat any of this stuff. And then you start to go, oh, and then you wilt, and you know, and then you feel flawed, and then you didn't do it right. And then you get annoyed. Yeah. And the rest of your day isn't much fun. So, yes, we, we do want everybody to be happy. We do want it to be a happy thing. That's the way we go into it. And I think everybody comes with the idea, this, you know, this will be good. It's good for families to get together. I'd like to see the grandkids. I'd like to see, you know, the people I don't see, but three or four times a year. That will be nice. But then when we get there, we start judging we start assessing yeah, and then it doesn't get, you know, then it, it, that kind of ruins the point of it, which is gratitude. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just so fascinating because it, it is definitely the opposite of what we want, but it's like these expectations that we have that everybody, I guess that's it. It's our expectation that everybody will, love and approve of us even well, though we don't love and approve of anybody else <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's not, not I, maybe that's an expectation but it's it's more a a, a hope a, a hope. belief a want a need we want people to approve of us we want people to say oh what a good job what a lovely meal oh what a nice house you have you know it looks so perfect and picked up my house is a mess and yours is always so nice and, you know, and you just kind of like that because you are a success. And the more fear you have about being inadequate, the more you need to hear about what, an, what a success you are. 
and that becomes very important to you. And if you don't get that from other people, then you feel, even if everybody's just neutral, that's not so good. You need people to really find you and what you're doing a success. And, you've, and if you go to somebody else's house and not your, theirs, it's the same thing. Oh, everybody says, you know, everybody compliments the cook and everybody, you know, says nice things because that's polite. We've all learned to be polite, but we also know the difference between acting and being, you know, and we're all aware of that. We think we're good actors and nobody else is aware of us acting, but we're aware of everybody else who's acting. <clears throat> and when we uh, hear those little uh, polite uh, niceties, we just brush them off because we know that's just the thing you say when you go to somebody's house, you know, and we, we don't take that. It has to be something more than that before we're really satisfied. Mm -hmm. And not too many people are willing to give much more than that. They do the pleasant niceties that, you know, falls under acting nice under politeness. And that's kind of as far as most people are willing to go. Yeah. So how do we be more conscious? How can we identify when we're sort of, and what should we do about it? When we, when we find ourselves in that position where we're, you know, seeking approval or trying to be right and <laughs> everybody else is wrong. I mean, how do we, how do we stop that silly pattern? Cause it's, it just keeps building instead of, especially once it starts, once you get in there and as you say, you know, your anger may be triggered or you're feeling very self-conscious or, you know, how do you just have the courage to say, wait a minute, this isn't about me. This is, this is a family thing. Let's enjoy it as a family instead of each person, you know, fighting their own battle. Well, I think when you, if you notice that you're doing that, if you notice that here you are poised, just hungry for compliments or hungry for, you know, for, for positive things said about you, hungry for validation of being a good, worthy person. As soon as you feel that coming on, that you, that uh, that's important. Well, I hope everybody, you know, likes what I've made and I hope, you know, this and that, and you, you have this feeling that it, that's so important then you ought to just stop there and say, well, I'm feeling a little stress. I'm feeling a little anxiety. Stress and anxiety won't exist if there isn't fear. What's the fear? Well, obviously for that, the fear is of being inadequate. So you need to be told how adequate you are to help you believe that you're adequate. And anybody helps you kind of points out that you might be inadequate, then that's where the anger comes from. But if they say how adequate you are, then you feel good about that. That makes you feel happy. So as soon as you feel that stress, that anxiety, go looking for the fear. Well, the fear is that I really don't feel completely adequate. I need people to tell me I'm adequate in order to believe it. I don't just have that knowledge inside myself that I'm okay. I need other people to validate me. Well, when you have that, you say, well, where's that fear come from? you'll probably not be able to get rid of it right there on the spot, but that should be now a, a challenge for you. Where does that fear come from? Why do I feel inadequate? And try to answer that question. You'll probably find some detail when you were you know, six years old that created that. Some poor relationship you had in a dysfunctional family that made you feel that way, or even just some, something that nobody realized was important to you, but was very important to you. And it'll be one of those things. And then you just need to get rid of it. And you get rid of it by wanting to get rid of it, having a strong intent to get rid of it, mm -hmm. and trying not to feel that way, not to be that way. And when you start to feel that coming on, say, ah, no, I don't want to go there. If people compliment me and whatever, that's nice. And if they don't, that's okay too. Because I feel like I've done a good job. I've done what I can do. I've done what I've decided to do and what I decided was appropriate. 
And people will just have to deal with that. People just have to deal with me and who I am. And who I am felt like doing this. So that's what I did, you know, bread and water for Thanksgiving dinner. That's just what I felt like. And people are going to have to just deal with that when they come, because that's what I felt like, that we should be not partying, but we should be fasting and take it more seriously, whatever it is. I'm just making stuff up. But, you know, whatever it is, you have to do it because that's you. You're being authentic. And other people have to deal with that and you let them deal with it. But now it's not, that's not over at that point. It's not that you say, well, I'll just be authentic and everybody else suck it up cupcake, you know, deal with me. Here I am. Okay. That's being authentic. But once you're authentic, the, the next step and very important step is to be aware of how your authenticness is making other people feel. How, how are people interacting with you? You know, how is being you affecting others? And if you look at it and say, well, me being me is making other people unhappy. You know, it's making them sad. I'm doing things that other people don't like. People don't want bread and water for Thanksgiving dinner. That wasn't very appropriate. And then you have to look at it and say, well, you know, I'm concerned about others, not just being me. It's not just about me. I need to do things that make other people happy. But I have to do it on purpose, not because I'm trying to get praise, but because I think it would be best for all the other people. And that's why I'm doing it, because I want the other people to be happy. See, now it's about them. Hmm. It's about the other people, really about the other people, not just pretending that it's about the other people. So you have to you have to uh, be authentic first, because if you're not authentic, then you don't even know who you are. And you can't change anything in yourself if you're just an image and you're not real. So be real, however beautiful or ugly that might be. Be who you are. This is me. See how it affects people and realize that it's about lowering entropy. That means everybody wins. You know, not just you. It's not just lowering my entropy so I win and everybody loses, which is forcing everybody to eat bread and water, right? It's about everybody. Everybody needs to win. So you need to do those things that make other people happy. Because if they're happy with what you did, that pleases you. Whether you get any compliments or not, doesn't matter. You know, if they come and they do, now some people will come and they'll say, well, I don't like this or I don't like that or something. And you say, well, that's okay. That's just the way they are. That's not about me. It's about them. It's about what they don't like. It's not, hey, you failed to give me what I like. I say, well, you know, I'll remember that next year. You know, if I'm doing this again, I'll remember that Susie doesn't like spinach. So I'll still serve spinach because I like it, and most people do, but I'll serve something else that Susie can have instead of that. You know, I'll, I'll have a little something else for her that she does like, perhaps. So it's that sort of thing. You know, it's a, you make it about other others. And if you get criticism, that's okay. It, you learn from it. You say, all right somebody's not here not liking this or that or whatever and say well what can i do next time to make that better for them and you learn you don't say oh no i failed again i didn't do it right see that's just the fear it's oh that's them not me i did i did what best i could because you did you know you did everything you could think of that would make everybody feel good and if it doesn't work you learn from it. that's how you grow up doing the best you can with all your choices for the right reasons and then learning from the results. That's how you grow up. Don't be afraid to just do what you are and who you are, which should be trying to be kind and helpful to other people. You know, so you have that, but if it doesn't work, well, it's okay. You did what you did in good faith and tried. And if it doesn't work, no problem. Learn from it. It's about them. And now that you know more about them, you'll be able to please them better next time. You see, it's that 
kind of a thing rather than, oh, so-and-so always complaining. They don't like anything, you know, or maybe they're just saying they don't like stuff just to get at me because last time when I was at their house, I said how I didn't like stuff and they're just, they're just giving it back, you know, and you get all this other stuff going on. So that's the way you deal with it. Be yourself, be authentic, do what you think is best. So everybody wins, you know, good for everyone and still in consonance with who you are and what you want to do. And after you've done that, look and see, how does that play out in the world? How do people interact with that? How can I make that better next time? How can I make more you know, happiness? How can I make more satisfaction in the world next time? And then learn from it. Oh, I should have thought that some people are vegetarians. I never even considered that because nobody in your family is a vegetarian, you see, and you just didn't think about anybody being a vegetarian. Oh, okay. And all I had was meat stuff and egg stuff and milk and cheese and everything that was animal products. Okay. Well, sorry about that. But next time I'll remember, you see, you don't have to. Huh? <laughs> very, very healthy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, next time you just say, well, I, I learned that. I need to take that into consideration. You don't say, oh no, I failed. I screwed that up. You see, that's the old fear of being inadequate. You just say, oh well, they'll live, they'll get through it. It's not like, you know, this will be, you know, a terrible thing. And for them, you come and you're the you're the the one vegetarian in the family and you look at it and it's all it's all animal products, instead of saying, These people, you know, they know I'm a vegetarian. They just don't think of me and don't care. And instead of getting into your own fear and judging, just go, eh, okay, well, I'll just have extra salad. You know, I'll get by and I'll have fun and it'll be all right. You just learn to accept things the way they are and deal with that. So in that case, you see, if everybody's being authentic and everybody's learning and growing, then your your connections may not be perfect, but they just keep getting better and better. And if you are and others aren't, if you're learning and growing, but other people aren't, they're still very self-centered, well, then you just accept that's the way they are. Change the subjects, you know, that that are problematic and just work around it and say, well, that's just the way they are, but they're still part of the family and I still care, you know, whether they're doing all right and you can interact with them and laugh with them and distract them into things that are less problematic and just make it turn out to be as good as possible. Not that you're acting, not that you're manipulating, just because you care about everybody there. And it's not about you. It's not about you, you know, with the, with criticisms, it's really not about you with the rest of it. It's about your best effort to make everybody else have a good time. And that's true whether you're the host or whether you're the guest. Now think if you were in a party with a whole lot of people and everybody there had the attitude that they were gonna try to make it so that everybody else there had a good time. Pretty awesome party. <laughs> it'd be a pretty awesome party. Yeah, that would be good. So you just do that and, and it works out the way it works out. And if some people were grouchy because that's just the way they are, and all they could talk about was their own misery and, you know, all their health problems and this and that. And they're just kind of down and depressed and grouchy. Well, that's just the way they are. You can still come around and smile at them and, you know, uh, say something pleasant, change the subject, and then go on and talk to somebody else. You don't have to feel, you don't have to judge them as being a problem. You just have to deal with them as they are. So that's the, that's the key. Let people be who they are. Yeah. And I think if it's almost like if you could, you know, come up with a game just to figure out who people are and actually honestly listen to them instead of being in your head and thinking how they're different from you. <laughs> instead of <laughs> judging them. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, maybe set some rules. If you have people in your that are coming or that you know that will always talk about politics or religion, just say, you know what, for tonight, we're not going to talk about this because everybody always gets so emotionally involved and 
you know, maybe it's yeah. not appropriate to bring up. Exactly. So, so for tonight, we've got other things. We're all going to be, be grateful. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're not going to uh, do politics or religion or whatever it is that is contentious. So that's just uh, inappropriate discussion. Have that discussion some other time. But tonight, yeah, and if you're the host or hostess, then you can put that rule there. And if somebody starts to violate it, you can just say, uh-uh, <laughs> inappropriate. And then you change the subject. And yeah, you could do things like that. If, if, uh, and people will know that. Or well, they come to your house, they have to not be that way. That's not the time to start telling other people why they're so stupid and you're so smart, you know, because of your politics or your religion. You know, that's just not the place or the time for it. Yeah, it's too contentious of a topic anyway. Everybody has their own beliefs and they get so adamant about them. It's just not appropriate for... No. no. <laughs> no, in a, in a social gathering, you know, when I'm in a social gathering, even if it's a small gathering, or even if it's just a one-on-one -on -one gathering, and somebody brings that sort of thing up, I just don't respond to it. Mm. You know, I'll just, I have no response. You know, well, what do you think about so-and-so doing this and, you know, some political thing? And I just let it go. And either change the subject or say something that's just, Vanilla, you know, plain uh, bland, you know, vanilla that doesn't have any particular, uh, uh, I don't know, that doesn't uh, twang anybody's, anybody's, uh, you know, violent response. It's just not appropriate. Now, if a bunch of people want to get together to talk about that, fine. And even if they want to get people of the opposite side so they can, so that they can fight about it, fine, go do that, you know join a fight club, right? Where you where you you fight with words. But that's not appropriate for a family gathering. It's just not. It's not it's not appropriate for a social in a social setting. True. Yeah, there are places for that and but social settings are not one of them. Social settings have to be something where everybody wins. It's not that who's smart and who's stupid. Well, let's see, you know, and it ends up whoever's the loudest determines that, you know, and, and the most, uh, and, you know, yeah. and the most arrogant, right? Whoever's the most arrogant with the most volume, you know, turns out to be the winner. Well, not really. Everybody's a loser. Yeah. Everybody loses because nobody's having much fun. And we want to have it. Everybody wins. Not everybody loses. Yeah. And that's the attitude, right? That's where we should, that's how we should approach things instead of, but we all get so caught up. We're all so self-conscious about things. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to win, everything, but it's pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. We want to be the winner. We want to win. And unfortunately, the only way we can win is if other people lose. Right. Or they, they, <laughs> or they all agree with us. Or they all agree with us. That's the only way everybody can win is everybody agrees with us, but that's not likely to happen. So then don't, you know, you don't have to talk about contentious things. That's, uh, and people talk about contentious things because they think they are showing how smart they are, right. how learned they are, because anybody who's smart and learned would agree with them. <laughs> of course, you see. So by saying these things and being very adamant about it, what they're doing is strutting their superiority. Except the people that hold the opposite opinion also think their opinion <laughs> is superior. Of course. And that's a lose-lose. Nobody wins. Everybody is just, you know, flapping their ego around and... and uh, Nobody's really growing up or learning anything, and everybody leaves kind of grumbling about the the bad, dumb people who disagree with them. Yeah. Family's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's because we we get closer to them. We see them more often, more regularly. And, you know, the closer the person is to you, 
the more true it is that they are your teacher. You know, the, your, your biggest teacher is your significant other. You know, that's your biggest teacher. And after that, it's probably your children or pets, you know, whatever, Pe people, other conscious beings that you are close to. And the closer you are to them, the more they are your teachers. They uh, challenge you in ways that nobody else can. Yeah. That's why it's so easy when you go to the office. Because nobody knows anybody really very well. Everybody knows everybody just superficially. Therefore, because people have to work together, they try hard just to be polite and not to go into any kind of confrontational space. Unless, of course, it's about a, a work issue. Then confrontation's fine if it's a work issue, but not personal stuff or belief stuff. So they're very careful about that it's inappropriate there to be discussing, you know, religion or politics. That's, oh, every, everybody's pretty aware. Those are not good subjects at work <laughs> because everybody has to work together and they have to, you know, not be upset or annoyed with each other. Otherwise productivity f falls off. So you just don't talk about those things. Well, if, you know, why, why wouldn't that same idea hold in a family? You know, just, we don't do that. But in a, in a family, it's like, well, now we can just be who we are. You know, we can just annoy people. It's okay in a family <laughs> if we, you know, create situations where people can't work very well together because we're just a family. We don't have to work together. So we tend to just be ourselves more. And when we're ourselves more, that ego shows a lot. It's not ourselves being authentic. It's ourselves as an as a ego, ourselves with our fear. You know, that's the, that's who we think we should be. It's our own image of us. That's different than who we are ourselves as an authentic person, that we are just who we are. And we know that. We accept that. And we see how much good that does in the world. How does us being us interact with the rest of the world? Does it leave the rest of the world in a better place than who we are is a good thing. Does it leave the rest of the world in a, you know, in a not so good place? Well, then maybe we're not so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, what makes an interesting conversation is when you start talking about virtual reality. <laughs> <laughs> in a in a social setting it's fascinating <laughs> i like doing that but <laughs> i don't always have all of the information that i can just sort of ramble off at my fingertips yeah. as much as i should by this point yeah. right well virtual reality is a very uh in topic it's kind of a hot topic in our culture right now so uh yeah you bring up virtual reality you probably get a lot of people they it's uh, they're fascinated yeah sucks. Uh, fascinated by that <laughs> The kids probably will like it because that's something that they'll relate to better. The older, the older you are at that sort of a, uh, discussion, the less likely you are to see that it is a, you know, that it's a rational discussion, but just discussing things like, well, you know, a whole lot of scientists now think that's, that's the right idea, you know, which gives it then credibility, factual credibility that otherwise it's just kind of a crazy idea. But if the scientists are getting there, then, there may be something to it. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah, virtual reality is a, is a uh, good topic. It is. But most people just don't understand virtual reality very well. They get, you get, I get two responses about virtual reality. And one is, well, if it's a virtual reality, then it doesn't make any difference what we do. It's just the game. Nothing's, nothing's real. And if nothing's real, who cares? You know, you can do anything. Just go take your gun and shoot a few people. And it's not a problem because, oh, it's just a virtual reality. And it's like, no, that's absolutely wrong. Every choice you make is vital, is very important. And it doesn't get any more real than that. Everything's a virtual reality. There is nothing that's more real than the virtual reality. You know, it's not like, well, if it's a virtual reality, then there must be a real reality someplace. No, the only thing that's real is consciousness itself. Any kind of a reality where you're having experience, you know, an experiential interaction, that's a virtual reality. 
because experience is defined by the rules. There is no experience if there aren't any rules. If you're not in a virtual reality with a rule set, then there isn't any experience. It's the rules that make something feel hot or feel cold or rocks heavy or whatever else. You know, that's the rule set that gives you your experience. So anything you can experience in is a virtual reality. So it doesn't get any more real than that. Everything you do is important. Virtual doesn't mean fake. Virtual means computed. And that's kind of the point that where a lot of people get, get lost. They think, well, there's real realities and then there's fake realities. Because they're used to the reality they live in is the real reality. And then when you put on those VR goggles, that's the fake reality. That's not the real reality. But in fact, that's just another virtual reality inside a virtual reality. And the choices you make with those goggles on can affect your growth just like they do with the goggles off. If you're making serious choices and not just kind of randomly making choices, but if you're making choices that you, you know, particularly if they're moral choices, doesn't matter which virtual reality you're in, whether you're dreaming, whether you're here in this physical universe, or whether you've got goggles on and in some VR game, if you're making moral choices and you're, and you're serious about the game, then those choices help you grow or you know, evolve or de-evolve no matter which of those realities you're in, it's you making choices. What's the second thing they say? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's impossible. <laughs> Look, this thing's hard. You know, this is stuff here. This isn't virtual. You know, if it was virtual, I'd fall through this chair and say, no, it's not like that. <laughs> you're thinking of something else, but that's not virtual reality. Yeah. Because when they say that, they're thinking that they are real, but the chair isn't. Right. They're thinking that they, of course, must be real. It's just the environment is somehow fake. And they look at that and they say, well, that's crazy. That couldn't happen. And that's because it's not about them versus their environment. They are, are their body is also virtual. And um, they don't get that right away either. That's the second kind of big mistake that when they say, oh, that's impossible, that's just crazy. They're not aware that their body is also part of that virtual reality. It's a virtual body. And then when you point that out, they kind of don't have anything else to say for a while. They're kind of stuck there with the, you know, well, what does that mean? Because that has a lot of implications then that, that run fairly deep. And most of the time, people don't really want to go there because deep isn't the way most people are. Most people prefer shallow sound bites, you know, short little phrases that they can toss around at parties, but don't really have to think too much about. But we create that because of the way we educate people. We don't educate people to think. We don't teach um what um what's it called um not creative thinking but um decision critical decision making critical thinking we don't teach critical thinking in schools and matter of fact we teach just the opposite we say don't think just yeah. repeat back what i tell you Memorize these things because I'm going to ask them on a test and you need to write them down just the way I've told them to you, just the way they're said in the book. So we say, don't think. We don't want what you think. We want you to give the answer that's in the book. And by teaching people not to think, we have a whole you know, bunch of people out there. You might say the electorate out there that can't think critically. They can't separate something like an opinion from a fact. They have no idea. They hear opinions and they take them on as facts because they don't really understand the difference between opinions and the facts. That's part of, of um, critical thinking. And it's not as obvious as you think, well, I know an opinion from a fact, you know, but uh, sometimes those differences can be very subtle between those two. And unless you 
study a little bit about critical thinking, you, uh, you make mistakes. You start believing things are facts when they're not. And then once you believe it, that turns it into a fact in your own mind. And after that, you can't, you know, you can't see it any other way. You're trapped. So we raise our children to not be critical thinkers. We raise them to do as you're told. Obey the authority, do as you're told, fit in. Don't be too different. And that isn't helpful at all when we have, say, an election where people have to make you know, critical decisions about who's going to run the country and they have no capacity to think critically. Mm -hmm. Then it's all a matter of who has the most convincing propaganda. That's who wins, not who actually has credentials or, you know, experience or, you know, the right qualifications is not important anymore. Qualifications become irrelevant. It's who has the best propaganda and who can get their propaganda out to the right people. You know, that's the key. We need to know, well, this vote looks, you know, this state or this province and Canada, you know, it looks like a, it's going to be a swing boat. They could go either way. So we need to really push the propaganda at them. So it's, it's begins pro, the propaganda wars, not, not actually elections that have anything to do with candidates and issues and problems. You know, all of that becomes kind of irrelevant. It all gets wadded up in the propaganda to where there are almost no facts being talked about at all, only opinions and only emotional Very <laughs> and that's and that's the end of it well no that's not a good way to run you know a, a social group that's a that's a way that's going to end up in failure you know sooner or later so we need to do better with critical thinking yeah you i know. guess i'm thinking when you know it it probably is a great idea to come up with some ideas when we're thinking of Thanksgiving or when we're getting people together and on holidays. But I guess the key is to make sure you don't have an attachment to it. Like when I play around with the thing about virtual reality, it's great because I don't, I don't really have an attachment to it because I can't personally myself, I can't prove it, but I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, right? that, that word attachment, could also be called an ego attachment. Right. <laughs> you don't have your ego attached to it. It's not something that you else or, you know, you're not trying to convince other people how clever you are or the big ideas that you have, you know, there's no ego attached to it. If there's no ego attached to it, then it's fine. However, that conversation goes is okay. Right. And we shouldn't have any ego attached to anything. That's the whole point. We only have ego because we have fear. If we don't, if we get rid of our ego and get rid of our beliefs, then we are love and all of our relationships are great. Even with old, you know, Uncle George who drinks too much and is real uh, crabby. <laughs> our relationship with old Uncle George is great too. We have good relationships with everybody at that point because we let them be who they are. We're just nice to them and care about them and they are who they are and we deal with it. And they like that too. So we're, you know, old uncle George's favorite niece or nephew because we don't struggle and fight and tell him that he's stupid and that he's drunk and worthless and whatever. We just interact with him in the way we can and where it is and don't where we can't. And, that's all there is to it, you know, mm. particularly that's, that's easy if you don't live with Uncle George. If you do live with Uncle George, then that gets to be a little harder. Yes. But still, you can just do that. And people are who they are and they need to make their own choices. You need not to be an enabler, but at the same time, you need to care yeah. about them. So, yes, anything you can talk about if you're not attached with your ego and with your beliefs so basically if you're not attached with your fear to that subject and how smart you're going to sound and then you get upset because somebody says that's ridiculous 
Do you believe that dumb stuff? You know, and then you get, you know, you want to defend yourself. That's, that's because you have attachments to it. Yes. So avoid any type of conversation which you have an attachment to and then just sit there and enjoy yourself. <laughs> right. And if that means you just kind of listen and don't say uh -huh. much, well, that's okay too. Yep. That's all right too. And eventually you'll get to the point where you can talk and not be attached to anything. Yeah. Right. But you shouldn't be attached to the um, compliments. You know, getting compliments. You shouldn't be attached to people agreeing with you. You shouldn't be attached to any of those things. It's just the ego and your beliefs, your fear that make you attached. Yeah. And anxiety, I guess, is the place. It's the key. If you're going someplace or people are coming and you have anxiety, you have stress, that's the sign that you've got fear, ego, and belief involved in it some way. And you're not going to have as good a time as if you didn't have that stress. Yeah. You just go into it and say, well, I've thought about it and I've done the best I can and let's see what happens. Oh, I learned something here, learned something there. Oh, well, I'll integrate that next time. See, you don't feel bad. Oh, I failed. Oh, I didn't do it right. I'm so sorry. You know, you don't have any of that. You just, you go through life and you do and you observe and you learn. That's the way it should be. Yeah. So there's, there's your, there's your all in a nutshell, <laughs> little over an hour. <laughs> on how to have the best Thanksgiving and holiday season coming up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a great challenge. These are challenging times as far as, you know, because they're, they're social times. This Thanksgiving through Christmas through New Year's, I guess, Thanksgiving through New Year's are very social times. And it's a wonderful time to grow up. It's a wonderful time to do things differently to be differently so we're we're entering the growth season folks <laughs> where everybody has m more opportunities to grow up so let's make the best of the growth season yeah. Yeah. i guess winter is the social season because everybody has to stay inside so we're kind of limited to inside social events rather than strolls through the park and you know hikes in the woods but, um, yeah brings us together, which is a good thing. We need that. Even whether we like it or dislike it, we need it and should learn from it. All right. Well, it's been a great show. I think, yeah. I think this, I, I really like this show. <laughs> it was, it was gentle and relaxing. It was, it was good. All right. You've been listening to News for the Heart. We're beginning the Heart of What Matters with Tom Campbell. You can find out all about Tom if you go to his website, My Big Toe, or to his YouTube station, which has literally hundreds of videos. Um, and stay tuned. We'll be back next month. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lori. Have a question for Lori and want to be on the next News from the Heart show? Drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org. News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and bmajor.org.